we were at the Ripley Aquariums, and we, of course, saw many wonderful animals there. And if that, for my wife and I, prompts a discussion about what we used to believe, or whether or not, because I can't recall if I always accept, I know I was taught about evolution in school, but I can't recall if I always accepted it. It seemed to always be colored with this idea that there was a god in there monkeying around somewhere. Is there any realistic probability that any thinking agent could have been monkeying around in the process based on what we know uh, at this point? No. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have to be careful here because I was once being interviewed on television by a dreadful man whose name has mercifully escaped me. And he, um, he it, I, I didn't realize that he was a sort of plant for intelligent design. And he, he asked me whether I could think of any conceivable, what, what's the, the best scenario I could think of for life on this planet being intelligently designed. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll give him the best shot, which is, directed panspermia, the idea that um, Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel put, put, put out, which was that some alien civilization in a distant planet wanted to preserve their form of life. Perhaps they were going extinct or something of that sort. So they put bacteria of their form of life in the nose cone of a spaceship and sent it off into space, and it landed here and started life here. Now I, I I said, of course, I don't for a moment believe that, but you've asked me what's the best, uh, the best possibility for life to be designed in this, um, by, an by an alien. And he said, wait a minute. Richard Dawkins believes in little green men. <laughs> and this has dogged me ever since. And, and, I, and I regularly get on Twitter this is the guy who believes in <laughs> aliens seeding life on this planet and so on. It, this is something we've spoken about before, where it seems that there are some people who are going to either intentionally misunderstand and misrepresent what you've said, what anybody said, uh, or they are so horribly confused uh, that they don't seem to understand the basics of the English language. Now, I know that many of them are from the United States, and we've kind of butchered the English language. Uh, but as, as I walked around the aquarium today, aquariums today, and I, am, I made that note too, that there were multiples, uh, my wife mentioned something to me that you see just at the aquariums a broad diversity of life. And I can understand how someone who hasn't been trained and taught you know, about natural selection and the process and the, and the length of time involved could look at this and just say, I give up. I don't understand. Uh, it has to be magic. Somebody has to have done it. How I, I, we should be teaching this. I know there are schools in the United States that don't, even though they're supposed to. Uh, apart from just saying this needs to be the curriculum, what can we as a community do to, to encourage the sort of teaching and training on, on evolutionary theory that we need? I think I give up is a, actually quite a respectable response because it is astounding how complicated life is and how beautiful it is, how diverse it is and how it, it looks designed. And so I could well imagine people saying I give up. However, to say it must have been created, I mean, that's just illogical because it's no more easy to explain the origin of a creator than it is to explain the origin of the complexity of life itself. It's a total and complete non-explanation. So before Darwin came along, it would have been perfectly respectable to say, I give up. It's incredibly complicated. There's, there must be an explanation, but I can't think of it. And then Darwin came along and did think of it. Um, but to say, therefore, it must have been designed is a total and complete cop-out. It doesn't explain anything. It's actually contradictory. If you say, I give up, it must have been designed, then you're not, you haven't given up. Yeah. You've, you've offered an explanation. And exactly. You can, and you yes. don't even care if it's true. Exactly. So you, so you ask me, what can, what can we do to, to teach it? Well, um, you can write lots of books, as I've done. Um, that's <laughs> but then, of course, they've got to read them, and which, is, which is more of a problem. Um, 
you can um, you can do television. I suppose I've done a bit of that as well. Um, it is very difficult to get across. I mean, one of the problems is the sheer time involved. Nobody, nobody can grasp the immensity of time that, ge that, that geology allows in which evolution has happened. It is absolutely colossal. And so all our intuitions about the rate at which evolution might go let us down. We can't, we can't really understand how you could g go from, uh, from one species to another, let alone from a, a microbe to mammalian life. So getting across the sheer time scale is one thing. And there are various analogies, you're probably familiar with them, um, lots of them. One that I rather like is the, the one where you stretch your arm out. This, I didn't invent this, somebody else did. And you say, the middle of your throat, the middle of my tie here, um, is the origin of life. And the tip of my finger is the present. And the, the time involved, you've got the dinosaurs didn't come until about there. So way, way near, near the present. Um, he, human, he, the, the Homo sapiens ar arrived at about the, my fingernail there. And the whole of human history, the whole of recorded history, the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Jews and the Greeks and the Romans and all of human recorded history flies away in the dust from the stroke, from one stroke of the nail file. So we're accustomed to thinking of human history as, as long. We think in the mists of time back to the ancient Greeks, back to the ancient Egyptians, and we think so long ago. It's nothing. It's, it's just, as somebody else said, it's the just before the stroke of midnight on the, on the clock face of the geological time. Yeah, there's, there's a couple difficulties there. Not only our inability to properly grasp the time scales, but also our ego and our sense of self-importance. It, it, it seems strange that everything we know about humans could vanish in that analogous yes. stroke of a nail. Yes, I mean, an another analogy, I think, it, I can't remember, it might have been Mark Twain who suggested the layer of paint on top of the Eiffel Tower. That's, that's humanity. But the time scale involved is, is one thing. Another, another point you have to get across is that it is not chance. There are an awful lot of people who think they can simply dismiss evolution because it's the theory of chance. Well, any fool can see it can't possibly be a theory of chance. I mean, chance couldn't possibly give rise to the, the beauty, the elegance, the, the, the sheer designedness, the apparent designedness of living things. It cannot be that. The whole enterprise is to get away from random chance and to substitute something else. And Darwinian natural selection is the only substitute that has ever been proposed that could work.